yeah. everyone, at least to my understanding, everyone does work. <laughs> right? Yes, every in our own capacities, we all do work. That's true. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, every, yeah. Every, everyone does work and everyone has mm. their understanding of what work is. Mm. And, and so I've I've always had an interest in, mm. you know, doing like like something like a podcast or maybe do like a, a YouTube type thing, but mm. I hadn't like really tried at all. And mm. I I was curious of like how do you start, how do you do all that? But mm. um in doing this, like in going to this guy's channel and seeing how, how that went, what that experience mm. was like, uh, mm. hearing people's feedback and comments, it was quite encouraging. So I was mm. like, okay, maybe I can do a few tries, right? Like I can, I can have mm. a few recorded conversations mm. with people, see yes, how they yeah. go, um, mm. just to test out the idea and. And so yeah, so this is this is me testing out the idea. Uh, <laughs> I'll clap for you. I'll work. clap for you. Yeah, I've had you. I've had a, a personal YouTube channel for almost a um, one year. And, I started in October twenty twenty two. I'm one year and two months. Yeah, but YouTube is just you just have to get out of your mind and start. It yeah. just requires you to just start. Because I look back at my first videos I recorded of YouTube, I'm like, oh, Faith, you are so green like it's <laughs> green like the grass. I was just too green, like even filming, even where to look when you're filming, even composing myself. I had a script. I could not really read the script. So it's just about starting. And as you start, you pick up the momentum and you also discover your style of communication. That's what I've learned on this journey. Because I've done podcasting. I've done podcasts since 2020. And with it, you notice that when I started, I was so bad. Like I could not, I had a lot of filler words. Like I would just say, um, uh, 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 like even some other words, I would truncate them. But with time, as you keep doing it, you notice you're becoming better at communication, being clear in how you talk. It just takes time. So I encourage you to start. Believe me, even if you're just not, because when I started it, when I started podcast, I was just doing it to improve on my speech. But I know my speech has come a long way and I feel I'm like in a better place to communicate because I've done it over and over again and I've built that courage in myself to know what to say and when to say it and how to communicate it. So you do it, first do it for yourself. Like if you have a personal goal, probably become a better communicator or learn how to, because communication is different. That's what I know. How we communicate to your child is different. How you communicate to your boss, how you communicate to a colleague is different. How you communicate to your parents. So it's different. So it's about picking up your style. And in no time, you discover what you enjoy. Because even when I sit and film videos, sometimes I'm like, ah, this one I know what I did is good, you know. There's a video I'll share with you when we are done. And you watch and tell me, give me, give me honest feedback. I just want to hear your honest feedback when you watch it. But yeah, just start. You can start with this podcasting. This podcasting is good because for it, it's a, a bit low entry in terms of entering. You don't need a lot of gadgets. You can you just need to have a good webcam, good audio, and the rest can flow. I have a microphone. I use this one, the Blue Yeti. Have you seen it? Yeah, I've seen people use that. Yeah. Yeah, it's the one I usually use most of the time. Actually, could I plug it? But it works. If you ever want us to record the, the, this one, we can re-record it because I didn't plug it in. But nah, it, 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 it's fine. Mm. So mm. because I went, um, it's interesting. So I was listening to there's a guy, what's his name, Chris, Chris Williamson. He runs a channel called Modern Wisdom, mm. um, and he was uh, hosted by I forget the guy's name, Steve something, Steve Ballet on. Um, the guy of the CEO, I know him. Yeah, yeah. that guy. Yeah. So, yeah. so there were, I was listening to them talk, and and he mentioned something that if you go back to anyone's channel, like anyone who you see being successful or you think are yes. successful, like go back mm. to their first videos, yes, and see where they started from. That's how you will see. That's how you get. To see that's how you evolve. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and and I actually 
tried it like oh, okay I, I'll, I'll go back and see so i i went to his channel and you could see you know i think his was like he said about five years back and mm. you could see it was a real struggle right like even even me who is uh who hasn't done this like i could give him <laughs> and what happened like even tony one yeah. time was listening to my like listening to my podcast it's like say like this i'm like tony you can critique me, it's okay. I know you're doing it from a side of love, but if I gave you the microphone and I told you to record me, even if it's just a two minute podcast episode, even if you've scripted it, you'll be as worse as me. <laughs> or even worse. It's like, yeah. Yeah. So it's all about starting. When you start, you really overcome the friction of starting is usually the hardest because we get too much into our brains and you think, okay, if I do it, who'll listen? Because me, my own fear was when I put it out there, people are going to come and bash me and tell me I don't know what to do, what I don't know what to say. But surprisingly, I posted the first video. People liked it and even commented. I'm like, okay, who are these people coming from, you know? Then I'm like, and I did the second, I did the third. Now I've done so many videos on my YouTube channel. And it's been a gradual process of improving, learning where to look, like how you told me you're figuring out the lights. It's It's a lot. It's really a lot. And I noticed like... The way nowadays we consume knowledge is totally different from how we did it those days. Those days, I've always been a reader. I've always been a person who's interested in personal development. Then I wanted to excel in my studies and become a better person and probably become a doctor. But I've always been that person who yearns for. And when I learn something, it's best for me. When I learn it, I want to share it with someone so that they also improve. And that's the best way I learn. I learn by communicating. If I've learned something, I'd want to. It's someone I can digest what I've learned, tell them about what I've learned. So that's how I was like starting a podcast was really a good idea for me. Yeah, yeah. so just just give it a go. Just give it a go, really. That's what I yeah, can it's, say. Yeah, it's the same. Mm-hmm. Like uh, I've been doing a lot of uh, learning of my own. And, mm. and I think like I've gotten to a place whereby it's, you know, like, you get to a place, of course, learning never ends, but you get to a place where you're comfortable with a certain, you know, amount of material that... That's what I was about to say. <laughs> yeah, that, that you can talk yeah. about it, right? Like, yes, you, you yeah. develop your own, your own interpretation of this, mm, mm. such that now you have, um, you have your own insight from that space. So, then I think once you have you've developed your own insights, then you have something to share. But it takes a while to get to that point where you oh. you have the insights. Yes. So, yeah, I feel like I'm getting around there. But but the the more interesting aspect, like why I really want to do it, is it's like a really selfish reason. Like I really it, just enjoy having long conversations. <laughs> that's cool. That's that's what I'm telling you. Like do it because I was about to tell you that do it for yourself. You know, many of the times we do things. If many people want to do things where there's a monetary attachment to it, you know, like if I do it, is it going to pay me? Am I going to earn from it? But sometimes it's about you just putting yourself first. You say this is what I enjoy. Let me do it and see who will follow me. Like you'll be surprised. There will be so many people who are willing to listen to you talk, and you're like, okay. I didn't know there's a crowd that, and that's one of the lessons I've learned while doing YouTube is that your tribe and your crowd, they call it a YouTube tribe, will find you. People who are interested in your content will find you, subscribe, and watch every single time. Because even YouTube, when you go in, the, in analytics, it tells you how many people are returning every week to watch your videos. You're like, okay, these guys, they're really invested in what I do. So it's just about starting. Yeah. yeah. And also when you accumulated a lot of knowledge you reach a point where it has capped like unless you put that knowledge to use it just stays in your head you know yeah i got to that extent where i consumed a lot i've read books last year i read 125 books (laughs) like i would read books listen to many audio books like all the time i'm listening to something writing down something then you reach a point where you know a lot of all this information in your head but you cannot really use it constructively to your benefit you're just accumulating adding on adding on adding on and for me i don't really like fiction i want things which are practical (laughs) so i basically consume a lot of practical information in terms of podcasts in terms of books in terms of blog posts substack like 
that's what I do. So I reached a point where my brain is full of so much information. And I'm like, what's the use of me just accumulating it and leaving it in my brain? Either I write about it or I talk about it or I share it in a given way or form. And yeah. that's where I started. I'm like, okay, let me just document what I've learned. Sometimes I go back and listen to the podcast I recorded. Like that when I sent you, I went back and listened to it and I'm like, I'm wise, you know, I know things. Like I really know things. Not that I'm I'm coming at it from a selfish way of thinking I'm very wise, I can't learn, but I'm like, at least sometimes I also make sense. Like if I don't get out of get that out of my head, I won't know that I'm that's what I'm thinking at that point. Because my podcast episodes are not scripted. I just sit, I'm like, okay, let me talk. When I feel like I'm tired, I'm like, I'm done, guys, I'm done. I'm you know? Yeah. So that's what I've no, learned. That's... No, that's really mm. good. Uh, and, you know, I think unscripted is the best way to go because then it just flows. Mm. And even when, you know, someone's watching or listening, you can, I think it's it's more like at um, at a pace that is uh, relatable. That is, you know, if it's too fast, then, you know, mm. people struggle. If it's too slow, then it has mm. to be, it has to be close to, real like you know like having a conversation kind of like what we're doing now yes Um, Mm. yeah and so because of that i think like that is uh that is when people's wisdom manifests so Mm because like i'm a strong believer that um everyone is wise uh otherwise they Mm. wouldn't uh like i have this dark joke (laughs) Like, How dark like, is it? <laughs> well, it's like the the fact that something exists is mm. the evidence of its wisdom. Okay. <laughs> like if, all those Elab- that in, uh, all elaborate those that, on that. <laughs> yeah, all, all those that didn't manage to exist failed mm. to have a wisdom, or all those oh. that that fell out of existence lost mm. their wisdom. Like their wisdom stopped being compatible with reality. And mm. so, like, whoever is, like, alive in reality, mm. they are mm. not wrong. <laughs> oh. Yeah, so we need to, because there's, there's this whole thinking of, you know, it's I think it's an American way, you know, a capitalistic way of trying to win, trying to be the best at everything. Mm. Mm. I get that. Like, it's it's useful. However, I feel like everyone is right in their own way and it's it takes um like patience and 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 holding a space for them mm. for, for their perspective to make sense yes and 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 once once their perspective can make sense mm. then then you can see from where they are seeing or from where mm. they are looking and then you can now appreciate their reality and then mm. see, see what's real about their reality now you may yes. not agree with all of it yes you, you, you may not adapt to their reality but at least you mm. see it yeah and the, and the moment you see it you can't you can't dismiss it you can't say they are wrong that's true oh, i, I, yeah, I agree with only, that mm. yeah mm. the only time you say they are wrong is before you see it <laughs> yes I agree with that because let's say if you're in, let's say if you go for a movie or see an event together, me and you, everyone will pick their own perspective. Everyone will see that event in a given way. Like, well, let's say if I sit to watch a movie with Tony, my husband, when I sit to watch a movie, I'll notice a scene and for him, he might not notice it. We might have watched the same scene, but I'll pick something different from it, you know? So everyone's perspective is to themselves. And that means if my perspective is like, oh, the movie was nice, this one happened because of this, did you see the body language? And for him, it's like, body language? Me, I saw the masasi. I saw, I saw the bullets being fired. You're like, okay. So his perception of that scenario is different from my perception, but we are all right in our own capacity because we've all experienced it in a given form. So that's, the same applies to wisdom. Everyone is wise in their own way. That's why you'll find someone doing something and they're excelling at it. But for you, look at it and you're like, ah, why would the person do that? Because I remember during COVID, this guy, I think he's, he's, Af- he's from Africa, but I think he's French. 
the one who used to do videos and you would show people how someone opens a bottle or how someone cracks an egg another person is showing how they crack an egg then you do like at the end of the video you know and that made him a popular guy for him working for louis vuitton and all the other companies worked with but that is just something simple have someone having a reaction of how someone else is doing something you see something small that for you as a person you disregard for him it's worked out for him you know <laughs> and if they put you in his shoes to do the same thing probably it would not work for you you know so i believe wisdom is to everyone every every one of us we are wise in our own capacity and most times the things you consider not to be the things you're wise in are the things that are actually going to move the needle or help you get ahead or do whatever you want to do yeah let's say if someone at your workplace comes to you every day and tells you Clayton help me with this Clayton help me with this and you're like oh, this is simple why are you coming to me for such a thing yeah? but that person is struggling that's why they're coming to you to ask you for that thing that she will consider to be a simple thing yeah so yeah I believe yeah, we, we all... are always in our capacities yeah mm. yes and, and we all have different like perceptions of experience it's like I, I was writing something on it recently like I, I call it the like a language of experience right mm. like we, th we like to think about language as you know text and uh speech mm. yeah or maybe sign language mm. uh, just to sort of like transmit words uh, mm. but it's actually I think it's a multi-layered thing language uh, like it's like, yes, there's text, there's speech, but there's also there's uh, gestures, there's expressions, there's, mm. uh, it, it, it like goes all the way to how we experience, because like everybody's, everybody's way of experiencing, kind of like what we've just been talking about, is unique to them. And so how mm. they, it's like how they interpret, it's within their own language. And I think, uh, one thing we struggle to to do is to understand that language is a tool like mm. we're meant to see through the language and look at what it's pointing to look for the meaning of what it's trying to point to um mm. that's 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 the best use because like you notice uh, like for example uh you know you, you, the people you live with like your husband your your mm. children um, mm you'll notice that you understand them, even if they use the wrong words. The same, yeah. yeah. My so one-year-old. <laughs> yeah, so you can, My, you, can, yeah. You, you, can, you can tune in to what they mean, mm. and, and that's going to take a bit of what they're saying, mm. uh, but also the context of where they are, mm. uh, the other gestures they're putting around, and what the whole situation is. It's like yeah. if you... If you account for all those pieces of information, you mm. can get what they mean. And then all of a sudden, what they are trying to say mm. is it's like it's useful, but it's not a limitation. It's yeah. like, yeah, where, where you kind of tell somebody, it's like, yeah, 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 I think you mean this because mm. I can I can see, like, you know, I, I can see what you mean. And so yeah. it's, mm. it's like you read the language, uh, you have to read the meaning in the language mm. otherwise uh if you don't do that then you sort of you you're not getting enough mm. and, and then you're going to misinterpret yeah yes like deciphering my daughter's language is 20 months but her speech is not really devolved she just says ah uh, ah uh, ah uh, but I'm able to understand what she wants and when you tell her something for what she understands when I talk to her I tell her bring the spoon she'll bring the spoon come here she'll come you know even though she's not verbal right now she's not speaking as yet i can be able to understand and we can also communicate in between each other <laughs> and she's able to do what i'm telling her close the door she'll close it bring your dress she brings the dress you know so language is more than just a verbal yeah yeah which, which speaks to everybody's wisdom right yes <laughs> yeah, like, yeah yeah it's like mm. if, if your one-year-old daughter uh mm -hmm and interpret you <laughs> mm. and understand what you mean even if yes. she, she doesn't 
she doesn't speak. have all the capacity she can't even speak. Do, she can't even mm. manage to to do speech yet but she, mm. like, even in her one year oldness she has the wisdom to interpret mm-hmm. what's going on right yes mm. and 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 you uh, you know it, you could even push the example to like uh you know plants like they know mm-hmm. where the sun is right like <laughs> They That's why they point. Been, they uh, they right? point to the sun. You know, they grow yeah. towards the sun, the light. Yeah. Mm. yeah. The the yeah. Pets, like mm. they, they they are trained and they behave a certain way. Without the capacity for wisdom, mm. that would not work. That's why we can't train rocks. Like we have to force Cut them, them into shape. Right? Like, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Force them into shape because for them we can't reason with them. But everything that we can reason with, sort mm. of, uh, you know, we we sort of like use a, a relational way to break through yeah. um have you but, have you thought of how the world would be if everyone shared their wisdom yeah yeah mm. that this is this is what uh this is what i've been curious about like uh for example like to maybe paint in more of the context like we are immigrants we're mm. immigrants here where we are right and yes. This is like um, we have to adapt to this place, and we find some things strange, right? As mm. as we do our life here, um, but more interestingly, we also come from a different place, right? We have yes. we have families back home, mm-hmm. right? We have we have lived a different life before we've lived this life, mm-hmm. and so we're always juxtaposing, right? Yeah. We're always going like ah where I come from, <laughs> mm-hmm. this this would not work this way, or this would be different in this way. And it's not like we ever go at, you know, and, and, and at some point, maybe like when we have just come here and we're, we're, we're still settling in, we feel like um, that we are sort of uh, maybe, how do I describe it? Like we are... In some cases, you may feel like we're in a better scenario, right, than what we were. But after time, you feel like actually it seems to be slightly better in these ways, but there are also these other ways. Yes. The, the situation I was in was mm. better than the situation I'm in. And then all of a sudden it starts to unfold to you that it's there's a difference but it's not a co- it's not a comparison of like uh you know good or bad mm. good or bad right it's it's mm. more like it's more like a difference it's like oh in this scenario uh mm. these are all the opportunities that i have right like if i'm mm. back home uh in uganda and when i'm here it's here are all the opportunities that i have which are different mm. <laughs> but but not the it's just more appreciating the difference and because Mm. of that you start to see like the the thing that is being revealed to me of that is the wisdom of our cultures back home like what what they were solving for what they were trying to address in their ways Mm. uh, of being and you know for a while when you're still youthful and growing up you kind of go like ah Nah, culture is dead, right? Like it doesn't. We should leave those things. Yeah, it doesn't mm, matter. Yeah. Those things are for the, the for the old people. The you know, us we are modern, right? Mm, then mm. later on, you realize no, actually, um, considering their circumstances at the time, this was a genius solution, right? Yes. Because mm. <laughs> they, they were figuring out how to manage this kind of problem. Um, yeah. And you will see, like. I was talking to Daniel about this in, in I think in one of those conversations that in the West here mm. you're seeing a big rise of a mental health crisis. Right? Mm. It's a big problem. And part of the problem is that uh, in the West you have a lot of individualization. It's like you can, mm. you, the communities have been set up that you don't have to be in deep relation with your neighbors. And yeah. You need to know them 
but you can you can be on your own within a, a common setting which seems okay but then you you're not connected and mm. and back home <laughs> you have another conundrum whereby everybody knows you right <laughs> everybody knows you everybody <laughs> wants to be in your business yes uh, <laughs> individual mm. and so it's kind of like you, you you feel like you're held back from progressing as far as you would want to because your your resources are spread thin through like mm. a big you know extended family or a big community uh, mm. you know because you know that that's how it is like everybody is like tribal society everybody is connected but yeah. because of that connectedness connection from, yeah mm. from, from that kind of setup mm. you have you have less you'd say less mental health crisis and it's not like that doesn't mean that there is no mental illness the mental illnesses are there but yeah. they are they're not as soul crushing as the ones here because you're not isolated it's like every now and then uh you know someone interacts with you there's a lot of people interacting with this you 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 and there's too much interaction to the point yeah. that you never sense you never get to a place of loneliness or that's or, or, or being, I don't know, like feeling isolated. Like it's a strange feeling, right? Mm -hmm, and all of mm -hmm. a sudden, when, when you move here, that's mm. the first thing you feel so deeply because you're like, whoa, <laughs> how, how come I can't? I'm missing people, right? Like connections. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah, where, that's where true. Are people, where are the people, right? Like yeah. you all of a sudden feel the absence of the people. That's because, mm. like, you know, they were always there. I don't mm. know why. Yeah, so so I see that, like it's sort of like the the wisdom of our cultures back home is starting to like unfold slowly for me as well. Yes, yeah. What I would add on that, like, because now when you come to live, let's say in Australia, what happens? We end up having to look for our own people. Like we look for the Ugandans in Queensland. You might look for the Kenyans in Queensland or the Kenyans in Sydney because there is that interconnectedness we've grown up with that we are missing. And also, what happens if you can't get that? That's when you see, even for the Western place where we live, you find that people are now going out to create more of these channels, YouTube channel where you create your own community. It's a digital community, but they're also looking for that community because as humans we are not grown we are not built to be in isolation we are built to be working together exchanging information exchanging wisdom like we lack that if you lack that contact with people there's there's different ways that the contacts are coming up in terms of the digital world people are forming communities people are, like people are forming facebook groups they are forming discords and slack communities different communities or Instagram or TikTok because they are looking for that <laughs> that connection that is missing in the physical sense. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. No, the, the connection is is important. But but speaking of you know the connection, I wanted to take you back to to you know what was what I wanted to talk about earlier, you know, yes. work mm. and what what that that means for you and then maybe we yes. can look at uh you know what is it that you do as your work or what is it that you define as your work yeah. yeah so work for me my perspective when it comes to work has shifted over time when i just started my career in 2011 i knew work okay we've always worked like let's say you do house chores at home you help your parents you go to school and study that is also work because you're studying to become a better person you might not be getting a remuneration but you are putting in the work to end up having a paper or a certificate or a degree or a master's or a phd to get you where you want to go so initially i believe that work for me was going to be the grind the nine to five grind whereby i have to go to work work nine to five and a salary and go home and choose the work, choose, choose the type of work that I enjoy. Of course, all the things I've done in my life, gladly I've been enjoying them. Like I don't say that my parents pushed on me anything that I didn't enjoy. Of course, my mom had a, had a hand in by choosing the subjects that I did in high school to get to university. But I found myself enjoying what I had chosen to do. 
And my perception was like, work is where I'm going to earn a living and establish my life. Fast forward to getting to my work in Uganda when I was working at Uganda Virus Research Institute. I got in very ambitious. As a young girl, you're so ambitious. You have all these goals. Then I get to the workplace. I found everyone else lay back. A government institution, nothing moves, you know. And the reason why I wanted to go there because I expected to get in and have people to push me because you expect those big organizations have like a great structure when it comes to career progression. Like you go through in, if you enter first year, by the time you leave, let's say the year, year or two later, you should be on a different level than how you came in. I didn't get that. So I got to a point and I'm like, you know what? I don't envision myself doing this bench work because I used to do research, biomedical research, whereby you take people's blood samples, analyze them, find out what they are suffering from, then advise the Ministry of Health to change their treatment in terms of antivirals because I was working on HIV. So I got to an extent and I'm like, you know what, Faith? I don't think if I'm to stay here for the next five years, I'll be like all these other guys I'm seeing because there had been guys who had been there from 1987. I was born in 1987, at the end of 1987, you see? And they had been working in that same place. I've entered there, I'm like 22, 23. And I'm seeing these guys that have been there for 20 years. They're still doing the repetitive work of every day. I knew that work was not going to serve me. So to me, my definition of work has always been something that is fulfilling, something that creates an impact, and something that I earn from a living. That was my perception. So I had to leave. I left to go to the University of Manchester to do my master's. I get there, I enjoyed it. I also got involved in the different work the university was doing. I've always been a person who loves outreach. I want to help as many people as I can. And when I learn something, I want to pass it on down to the generation behind me. Because while I was advancing my career, I didn't have that. I didn't have that, like looking for mentor, you have to do it yourself. Looking for someone to guide you, you have to do it yourself. If you're not doing it, no one else is going to lift you up, you know? So that has always been one of the guiding principles and value that I hold deeply. So I get to Manchester, I do my master's, I'm done with the master's, I'm thinking, what can I do? I always wanted to be a doctor in some way or form, so I'm like, okay, let me get a PhD. So I get the PhD in Australia, I get a scholarship, I moved to Australia to do my PhD. And my PhD was really hard because I had a lot of issues with my supervisors. And I found that they were not really understanding my way of working. I'm a self-motivated person. I love to do things out of my motivation. I don't like people who coerce me to do things. And I also love it when I'm working. Someone should give me the autonomy to think because I have a brain, you know? <laughs> so if someone is not giving me the autonomy to think, I feel I'm caged in because I can't really be expressive. I don't feel like I'm creative. And that's what I faced in my PhD. It was a blow to my confidence. My confidence just tanked. So during my PhD, I kept on wondering, am I really doing the right thing? Do I really need to be here? Those are the questions I used to journal about almost every single day. So I get half, I get almost at the end of the PhD. The PhD is not working because we are at loggerheads with the supervisor. I, I'm the one doing the research. I'm telling them, let's do this. They're saying, no, we can't do that. We don't have resources. You don't know anything. You know, like there was no belief in me until I got myself a mentor. I attribute most of my success for my PhD to my mentor. He sat me down. He's like, you know what, Faith? After you finish this PhD, your life will be totally different when you have that piece of paper in your hand. You know? Just carve in and understand that it's your PhD, right? But let your supervisors do whatever they want to do with the PhD because they've showed you all these three years that your say doesn't have anything. Like, it doesn't matter what you say. So I decided to just do as they did, as they suggested. So I did the PhD, finished it, submitted my thesis, and my life started there. Of course, I had my baby, my son, and when I had my son, we had the we had the pandemic. So I sat back and I kept on asking myself, what exactly do I want to do for work? What work will I be doing to make me feel very, very in line with my goals and also feel accomplished? And I decided. Initially, I wanted to be a professor, but I was like, you know what? Professor life is not my life. That has to stop. Then I kept on like 
doing self-discovery in terms of journaling, in learning, just just trying out different things. And I found that I really enjoy translational research. Translational research is whereby you have something that you can translate into either a drug, a treatment, a policy. And it took me time to get a job, of course, because I wasn't taking the traditional route of doing a postdoc whereby you research different research like different aspects of, let's say, virus, because I'm a virologist. I wanted to do the biotech whereby we're making drugs, therapeutics, diagnostics, anything that we use to treat diseases or find out what someone is suffering from or vaccines. It's what I wanted to do. And of course, living in Australia, there are not so many opportunities like that. But luckily, one of them showed up and I applied, I got the job. So I got in, when I got into that place, I thrived. I just felt this was what I was called to do. It, there was never a single day that I went to work and I didn't feel like I needed to be there. Even some days I'll be like, my boss, can we do this? Like my ideas kept on flowing. I was in my own element. I felt fulfilled. And that's what I call work. My, my perception of work has changed that I have to do something fulfilling. It has to be something that engages my brain. It has to be something that has a cause either treatment, empowerment, like something that is giving back to the community, a cause in terms of giving back to community or improving livelihoods of anyone. And also whereby I can exercise some bit of autonomy. Autonomy not meaning that I don't want advice or mentorship or collaboration. I want to do things as a person in solitude, but autonomy in such a way that I am able to feel I'm contributing to a cause and also given a chance to think and critically analyze situations that come up with critical ideas, which I can bring and discuss with you in terms of brainstorming and also just picking your idea, like bringing the idea to my bosses or someone I'm working with. So that's what I value as work. And if that is missing in work, I don't feel com accomplished when I'm doing that work. I want a place whereby um, using my brain, it's creative, it has a cause, I feel some bit of a key and also creativity in terms of thinking up, coming up with new ideas, trying new things, experimenting, and seeing where work goes. That's what mm. my work is. That's what I would wow. consider to be fulfilling work. That, that's, that's very good. And it's a very mm. good uh, articulation of, you know, your how you know what you look for or what you define uh work to be and i think mm. thank you for sharing that journey of where it started mm. and where it's gotten to because um it takes time to develop that you'd say you know that that understanding of, of what it is because you know you've shared there like you, at every every step you discover you, you'd get in shock you know like when you went into to work at um with those old guys and who had been there <laughs> for over 20 years it's like mm. what you thought it was going to be was not what it was no and it so, wasn't at all yeah and so then you had to go back to the drawing board and and redefine it and because you, you have that sense in you of uh of what it's supposed to feel like like you know mm. what, you, 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 it sort of like would feel not right until, you know, over years you kept trying and trying until you go to a, a situation, a scenario where everything lined up and you went like, yes, this is exactly uh, where I should be. This is what, I, I, I this is the kind of work I, I've been looking forward to. Mm. And, and I think, yeah, I think it takes time to get to that point and um but also once you you so, sort of like you you don't need just time you also need to know what it is right otherwise you're not going to know when you find it yeah it, it seems like from the beginning you knew what it was going to be like you know it has to it has to be fulfilling there was there was that appetite for the fulfillment and and the moment the fulfillment was not there it's like it doesn't matter if it was paying a lot or not it's like that's a problem okay so it has to pay it has to be fulfilled, yeah. and i have to be 
engaged. And I think you also needed some a certain level of ownership where where you what you're doing matters, like it it impacts the the what you're doing in a way that sort of like you leave your signature on it that you know you know I've, I've added to it or I, I've shaped it in this way or I've uh, I've influenced it in a certain direction. Um, yes, yeah. yeah, that's that's what that's exactly what I've, what you've said. And what I want to add on that is. For me, defining my work has come down to my values because I do a bit, I do career coaching, not a bit, a lot of career coaching. I've coached over 100 people so far to advance their careers in different plights, not most of them clients, but many of them have coached them like they come to me for help and I'm able to help them streamline their careers and get amazing careers, change careers, get scholarships, get grants, like I'm good at that. I didn't know I was good at that until I had time to do that self-awareness of my own career journey where I've had time to iron out some things. I've had time to figure out some things. And it's amazing when you go on a personal development journey, you never know what you're going to find. Because as I've told you, when I entered in Uganda Virus Research Institute in 2021, in 2011 at Uganda Virus Research Institute, I knew that was... I pinnacle of research in Uganda. It was the place I always wanted to work at. When I went to my career to do my undergraduate, I was like, these are the organizations I want to work in. I'd listed them down. And getting there, I wouldn't say the organization is not nice, but because it's a governmentally owned organizations, things are done on a slower rate. And because I'm a millennial, <laughs> millennials, we are the people who want to like see things moving, you know? Because when I went in, I was like, yeah, I'm going to be there for two years. And in two years, I want to be thinking of getting a master's degree. And from a master's degree, probably I'll think of a PhD. And from a PhD, probably I'll come back to Uganda and we'll do big research. You know, those were the ideas I had flowing in my head. But when I went there, I noticed some of the things were not possible. My immediate supervisor was not cooperative. Like he would, he literally lied to me in my face, telling me that he had sent my references to the different universities that applied to. But he didn't, because the universities would write to me and like, oh, we could not we could not complete your application because we didn't receive your referees, and it was his that was missing for the rest of the referees that sent. So I figured out a way I had to get another mentor to help me. You know, like it's about work is about finding something that is fulfilling, fulfilling in a sense that you have to define your values. You have to know what would I consider as fulfilling in work. For me, it's about having a cause, as I've mentioned, something that I feel I'm using my creative juices. It's just about understanding your values and shaping your work to fit that, if it's under professional sense. Of course, there's this other work also that we do when you become a parent, you know? You have to nurture your family, like provide for your kids, be there for them. That's usually unpaid work, as they like to refer to it in Australia. <laughs> Did you do any unpaid work? But it's also work because you're shaping the next generation, you know. It might not be an exchange of monetary, but seeing your child learn how to talk, seeing your child learn how to spell. That's what I'm trying to teach my son now. I find it fulfilling because I'm empowering him. And that value of mine of empowerment is trickling down to him because I feel I'm empowering him with skills that he's going to use for the rest of his life, you know. So work to me is more than money. It's more than, it's doing something that is bigger than me, bigger than my, bigger than me as a person. And I've seen people who have very good jobs and very good money, but they are not fulfilled because the work they're doing is not in line with where they want to be. And those are some of the clients that end up helping advance their career. Someone comes, they have everything, but they're doing the work they thought would be fulfilling, but it's clashing with their values. So to me, work is all about aligning your values and also having that self-awareness because self-awareness is a big thing that many people don't take time to understand how to learn about yourself, how to figure out things you enjoy, how to figure out whether you're an introvert, whether you're extroverted, things that you enjoy, your strength, your weakness, your opportunities. We never take time because we live in this fast-paced world that we don't take time to really evaluate our lives. So to me, work is essentially something that aligns with my values. Let me not 
add in more. <laughs> no, you yeah. said uh, mm. very interesting stuff, and and I'll play back to you the things that I'm getting. Mm. Uh, like you, you've spoken about uh, values, and it's it's like you 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 connect them. You say, you know, the work has to it has to be fulfilling, right? Mm. But that fulfillment is the fulfillment of your values. Like it has to match up to your values. Yeah. So yes, which, yeah. Mm. Which means that you've invested time to cultivate the values, right? Yes. Because yes. it's like, it also takes work <laughs> to, to cultivate those values. Um, yes. It, they don't just manifest to you. And I think like, you know, you're, you're describing what you're doing for your son and, and your children, like trying to teach them things. And I think part of our, of the values that we all hold have mm. also been imparted in us. Not, yeah. It's like it's like they were imparted on us, you know, by those who cared for us. But then we had to work hard to, to flow, to, you know, to to kind of like grow into them and like really learn to make them better. flourish. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. To make them flourish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, at this point, you feel like you you're you're making like your what you're picking to invest your time and efforts in. Has to be mm. aligned with those things, but you had already to do that work first of all to make those things flourish. Right? Yes, that's true. Um, yeah, that's extremely true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and the other thing I, I was picking up on was um the awareness. It's like mm. you keep referring to this awareness. Like you have, you need a lot of self awareness to know. I think, and maybe you you will elaborate more on this but like it's it's like mm. the sense i'm getting is more like you need to know your capability right like you need to know uh yeah what is it that you can handle what is it that you have to offer where mm. do you need to grow and uh which things are out uh, outside of of what you you know you should be involving yourself is 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 that kind of along the same line yes 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 go okay let me elaborate more so Self-awareness. Self-awareness is a very important component that many of us, many people lack. But if you learn how to be self-aware, you learn a lot. You look, you'll also be able to like hone on to those things that you're already good at and make you flourish. Because my philosophy is that don't downplay your weaknesses, but upplay or foster your strength. Downplaying your weaknesses would be like recognizing, let's say, you're bad in communication and you just suppress it. You don't you don't offer yourself for opportunities to talk. You don't communicate well. You know you're not good at communication, so you really scratch it off. But with self-awareness, what happens is that you are aware of the entire whole being of who you are in terms of your weaknesses, your strength, your skills, your knowledge, how you're perceived by others how you perceive yourself, that is your self-image, and you work on it in such a way that you encompass it in your entire person. Because no one of us is not without a flaw. We are all flawed, you know? We all have our own weaknesses. We have our own strength. But many of us want to downplay the weaknesses and only consider your strength. That can work, but sometimes you also need to pick up those things that you're lagging. For instance... I've shared this, I share this, it's a story I always share about myself. I never knew I had a speech impediment for quite a long time. I used to think I just talk and people just don't understand what I'm saying. But it's until that I was aware of that issue that I had, that I had to work on it proactively. I got a speech coach. I did speech courses online. I got a microphone. When I got this microphone, it was out of my selfish interest. I wanted to record myself. I started doing good things like learning about how people talk, how to think fast and talk smarter. I started listening to podcasts that were about communication. I started taking time to think. I started getting rid of filler words. It's because I discovered that weakness and it was stopping me from doing all the things I wanted to do for my career and my life. So I had to find a way of bringing it up in the light and working on it to make sure that I improve I might not be the best public speaker, 
but I've come a long way because I noticed I was lacking that component in my life and I decided to come up and work on it proactively. And today I can have a conversation with you and I don't feel on the edge because most of the times when I noticed it, I was always on the edge wondering, has a person understood what I'm talking about? But now I'm able to have a conversation, karma and communicate without feeling like I'm not portraying the message well. So that's what it's all about, self-awareness. Self-awareness requires you tap into yourself and discover and listen also to other people's feedback. When people give you feedback, some people might give you good feedback in terms of it being constructive criticism, but other people might just give you feedback to put you down. So as a person, you have to be able to draw the line between the two. Is this person giving me constructive feedback or are they just giving me feedback to put me down, you know? So you have to also mm. understand that. And also you have to know when it comes to self-awareness, how do people perceive me? Yeah? Because there are people who will say things thinking what they said is okay, but when they cross the line, you know? And if you're not self-aware, you can never know that you've crossed a line when you've said something. So it's just about... It's a, it's, a, it's a full thing that a person has to understand themselves. And with self-awareness comes also self-growth because you'll be able to foster those things that you're good at and also work on those things that you are not good at, as I've explained. It also helps you to be yourself, authentic self, yeah? It increases your confidence because you'll be confident in your capabilities because you're aware of them, you know? It helps yeah. you have more empathy, like you deal with certain scenarios, let's say, if someone has lost a parent or someone has lost a job, you'll be able to empathize with yourself in their shoes and you wonder, okay, if if I lost my job, how would I feel, you know? So it's it's a 360 when it comes to self-awareness. It's one of the most important tools all of us need to cultivate on a day-to-day basis. Wow, that's that's beautiful, like how you describe it. And I think the I would want you to touch a bit more on that, but like what I want to appreciate mm. first of all is, um, you know, the Greeks used to say, I think either this must be from Socrates or Aristotle, but like mm. knowing thyself, like like they they had that as the the highest virtue someone can try to arise to. It's like it's like they acknowledged that there's a, a thing called the self yes. that drives you. And if you don't know what that thing is doing, there will be, you will end up being enslaved by it. Right? Mm. And you won't mm. know that, that it's making you do things. You may think it's you, but actually there's, there's something else. And, mm. and from what you're describing there, it's like you you've mentioned cultivating that awareness. Um, so so what maybe I'm curious about, like what I would like you to share a bit more of, what are those things you do to cultivate that awareness? Because when you describe how you're applying it, it's, uh, it's not something you'd say that is, you, you'd say you see a lot of people doing, sort of mm. like even describing from here in your description, like in your journey, this is a lot of like a, uh, a competence you've developed, like knowing, you know, to, to pick up real feedback from just the contextual awareness before even somebody tells you something, for you to be able to pick up on something like that, uh, mm. knowing how to, how you're coming across, how you're being received, uh, uh, being aware of all those nuances as mm. you communicate, right? It's, uh, yeah. it's like, a, it's like, an enhanced level of detail. I, I don't know. So, like, what what is it that you've been engaging in that has helped you to sort mm. of like hone these kinds of skills, like develop these competences? I think it's partly it's been about every day. I ask myself one question: What did I do? Then, when, from that, I can answer back, and I'm like, okay. Like today, I went to the city. I had a family member visiting Brisbane. I had to take him around it. I'm like, what lesson can I pick from today? It's about journaling. I have a journaling practice that I've used for the last four years. It really helped. Of course, I don't journal every day. Some days I journal. I can journal like for three days when I'm missing, but 
I do it whenever I can. Every day I ask myself, what did I do? Then from that, I look back and I'm like, okay, today I did this and this and this and this. So after that, I ask myself, what did I learn today? So it's just like I'm answering back the questions to myself. And while I'm answering those questions, I'm getting to the nitty gritty. I'm not, I'm not writing everything like, oh, I woke up, I brushed my teeth, I dressed the kids, I took them to school. I'm not doing that. I'm doing like, what did I do leading me to my goal? Because every year I have like specific goals I set for myself. And as I journal back to that, I refer back to that goal. And I also use that third person narrative. The third person narrative, what I do is ask myself questions. Like recently I applied, I want to get into being a lecturer. <laughs> Let me just say it here. I want to become a lecturer for university, but I applied for two lecturing jobs and I was denied one. I, was, I got a rejection. So I asked myself a question. What did I do? Then I am like, I applied for a lecturing job. What was the response? I got a regret. Faith, why did you get a regret? So I go back, because they just send you a generic message. You are not selected. It's generic as it is. So, so I'm like, probably, so I start thinking of boys, what would have happened? Probably I, they were not convinced that I have the experience to teach. Probably they doubted my English, you know, like I'm starting thinking of all these ideas. And I'm when I've come up with those reasons, I go back and I'm like, what can I do about this? So it's usually about asking myself questions of what instead of why, instead of saying, why did I not get selected for a job? Why leads you down a down spiral of thinking of probably I would say, probably because I'm black, let's say if I went, I went down that why I'm black, probably I think I've not studied in Australia, I only did a PhD. So I'm looking for all the bad things to discredit the person who was shortlisting, not putting myself in their shoes and saying, what could I have done better? What could I have communicated better? So I'm looking at the, the why takes you a down spiral of thinking of all the rumination, coming up with all the bad things that probably I'm, I'm taking the blame for myself and taking it to the selection committee. But the what is looking at me as faith and wondering, faith, what could you have done? Was it the application that you didn't do well? Did you try, did you convince them that you had what it take to be shortlisted, you see? So that way you are looking at your situation in an objectivity kind of way. You're not looking at your limitations, but you're looking at it from a wide angle. Your perception is totally different from a person who will ask themselves the question of why. That's yeah. one of the ways, yeah. The other way yeah. is usually it comes down to just trying to listen, like having a conversation with a person. It's good to listen, and listening is not only listening with your ears. You listen with your brain and also your eyes and picking up those cues. Like, let's say if you went to buy a coffee at a coffee shop at your workplace and the person smiles at you, but they smile, you look at them and you're like, they're not genuinely smiling, they're just smiling because they're serving you this coffee. You notice that. So it's, it's, it's a lot of things when it comes to self-awareness. So, but the most important one I've done is usually the journaling mm -hmm. and also seeking. seeking. I, like, I like feedback. Even when I got this job, rejection for not being shortlisted I wanted to write back and ask them but they're like you cannot reply to this email which is okay but I always want to have like a little bit of more feedback because it's from that feedback that I'm able to improve as a human and also become better or know if there's something that I did that was not right so I always love feedback I'm a person who will ask all the questions whenever it comes let's say for an interview or even my husband says I ask a lot of questions but because I want to understand I don't take things for face value. Because when you take oh, things for face value, <clears throat> what happens most times you might miss the gist. Like there's a podcast I was listening to. It's called the it's called the, the Science of Success. And this lady was explaining about self-awareness. I had my own views about self-awareness, but she was saying that many people apply for jobs and you think you have whatever it takes to get the job, but you end up not being shortlisted and you blame that people are shortlisting, but when the problem is really you, you see? And the other thing she also said was, other people can be in relationship. You think your relationship is very fine, your husband is very happy, even post pictures, you do whatever it is, then you hear three months down the lane, 
they're filing for divorce and you're wondering, these people seemed so happy on social media, were they just lying? But because they were not self-aware to know that there are things that were happening, especially when it comes to like external self-awareness, because there are two types of self-awareness, there's there are two types of awareness. There's self-awareness, how people perceive you and how you perceive yourself. So with self-awareness, yourself is that internal one whereby the way you perceive yourself and there's an external one whereby how aware are you of how other people are perceiving you. Yeah. And yeah, we wow. need to cultivate both. I think we can do it. We can do a detailed episode on this because <laughs> it's a big topic to, yeah, it's a big topic to really dive into because self-awareness is really very important in all aspects. Yeah, in all yeah, aspects it, of life we need it. Mm. It's really good. And and I'm um, in complete agreement. You know, you reminded me of, uh, I started a rule. I don't know how successful it's going so far. So I can't give those metrics, but I started a rule at home. Uh, mm. You know, when your children grow to a certain age, they start asking a lot of why questions. Yes. <laughs> so it was starting <laughs> to frustrate me. So yeah. I invented the rule. I said, look, why is not a good question. Mm. Don't ask why. Instead of asking why, mm. you should ask what. You can mm. ask how. You how? Can ask yeah. Who. You can ask where. Those are more tangible things that mm. you're going to get an answer for. The why comes across as if you're asking for one thing, mm. but it's a compound question. Like, the why is many things. It's like a bucket of things. Right, mm, mm. and you just asking that uh, is not it, it, it is it, you're not being kind to the person you're asking because you're asking them to give you a bucket all at once. Mm. But you want it in an instant. You want it in a small way. So I remember uh, Delvin, I my son. I asked him. You know, he asked a lot of why questions. So one time I mm. challenged him. I told him, hey, um, do you know why why is not a good question? <laughs> and he said, no, he didn't know why. So I asked him, you know, you ride a bike, right? And he said, yes, I ride a bike. So I asked him, tell me the one thing that I need to do to ride a bike. And and he took a moment and he he started to tell me like well you have to to pedal. you know you, you have to pedal right <laughs> I was like, yeah so if I if I don't if I just pedal right and I don't look where I'm going and I'm not holding the handlebars I will ride the bike successfully he said no <laughs> you also have to hold the handlebars you have to look where you're going mm -hmm. and you have to maintain the balance mm -hmm. I was like yeah but which is the one thing I need to do he's like no you have to do all of them. I was like, yeah, that is that is the why problem. It's like the the description you've given me for for a successful riding of a bike, mm. which requires all those things to be done successfully. Any one yes. of those things going off, missing, you're going to fail. fall. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. so when you're asking why, you're asking for all this detail yes. all at once, mm. and and that's too much. It's not fair. Yeah. Like it's yeah. not a fair question. So mm. most of the time, if you ask that, you're going to get frustration. Like, mm. and and then you wonder why you're evoking this frustration from other people. It's because your your question is annoying. Like it's, yes. it's a compound question. So you have to decompose it. And yes. when you decompose the question, you you're being kind. You you're being you you you're relating more. You 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 you're being fair. You're asking something that you can actually get. Yes. Uh, and so, I think that goes back to the awareness. Like if you mm. are aware that, oh wait, if I if I'm the one who had to answer this, why? Maybe mm. I would not ask it, right? <laughs> maybe yes. Maybe I'll take a moment and mm. think hard about what I'm asking for. Mm. So I can so I can decompose it a bit and ask for something a bit more specific, something a bit more particular. Yeah. Um, so yeah, why why is not a good question? Um, it's not a good question. I also yeah. agree. Yeah, because there can be very many reasons as to why something might have failed, 
or something might not have happened the way you wanted it to happen. So if you ask yourself a why, you're not going to come to a reason. Some people use the why question to come up with ways to put themselves down. Eh? Because you're just looking at it from a one side instead of looking at it in a 360, like this, 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 and this, and this might have failed, yeah. And yeah, yeah that, that's how I usually do with self-awareness. And it also takes, it takes time to just learn yourself, like look at your, like I've told you my career journey, I can already speak, I can already say my career journey from the time I started because I've had time to, I just don't, one year down my career doesn't just go without me sitting down and doing an evaluation. What did I achieve this year? Were there any things I learned from this year? And also that is also through journaling because I look back and I'm like, okay, 2023, what did I do? 2024, what do I want to do? Mm. It's the journaling, having a way to reflect and have that self-reflection to look deep into yourself and also look at your strength, look at things you've been complimented in, things that people always come to you for help or things that you enjoy doing. All that can help you become more self-aware because it makes no sense for you to do work that you don't find fulfilling. And many people, especially where we come back, we come from in Africa, Uganda, Kenya, wherever, people do jobs that they are not happy in because they have to pay bills. Even here, people do jobs they are not happy in because they have to pay bills. But if you want to really design work that is fulfilling for you, you have to know what that work is. And that requires you to have that self-reflection and play to your strength look at things you enjoy. It's like telling a computer scientist to go and become a surgeon, you know? If you really enjoy computer sciences and now you're going to go to become a surgeon, you kill people, <laughs> you know? So yeah. you play to your strength, play to things that you're good at, and that way you you don't feel like really work. Sometimes even now when I do the things of empowering people, I can sit here on my computer like on a Friday night and leave my table at 2 a.m., when I'm in total flow, like total flow where I do work, I might have some lo-fi music playing in the background, but I work at it and I will not feel like I'm really working. And I come up with very good ideas, design different courses and come up with podcast episodes. And I don't leave feeling like, oh, I'm tired. I feel stressed out. I worked so hard. I find I'm in flow because I really, really enjoy what I'm doing. Yeah, it's it's interesting you you mentioned flow as well. That's that's a very another very interesting subject that probably we could touch on another time. But mm. um, yeah, I just wanted to highlight that because um, from the way you're describing, it's like when all these things line up, right? Like your your intention of what you're working for, your values of what you're doing, your competence. Uh, so you're working within your limits. Uh, yeah. It's 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 what you intend, and your intention is aligned with your desire. You know, it's fulfilling, and mm. you it it's just enough of what you need to do, and it's giving you back uh, what you need, and and you you getting the feedback like it's immediate feedback as you do it. Then of course you will fall into the flow, and yeah. But I think. Once you do that, it's sort of like what you're talking about just then about, you know, it has to, there's a few other things which are going to be associated with what you're doing immediately that you can stretch into, um, as opposed to stretching yourself beyond your limits, like going into a whole complete different domain that would break your flow. Uh, yes. And so it's sort of like there's a, there's a certain, you'd say, range you you develop exactly. once you're doing things within that scope and then you find yourself flourishing more like they just reveal themselves to you kind of what you're talking about um especially because i want to ask you about that like how did you end up with uh getting into podcasting getting into uh youtube getting into uh coaching people who uh you know developing their career paths while doing all these things and uh, but again i can connect the dots because this is so this is an exploration you've been on yourself like yes you've gone, you've gone through this you 
you can empathize with these people. And so you're sort of taking some of the challenges you had to overcome mm -hmm. and, and, you know, compartmentalizing them and making them available in a way that can be accessible by those other people who may be struggling with those specific things. And, exactly. And you, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's sort of like drawing from your own experience and uh, to use a different language, sort of like you're trying to give your gifts. So, so to mm. gift, gift what you've, you've sort of like managed to collect along the way, mm. package it into these gifts that you can sort of give to others who are searching for these things. And they, they may have people, they may not yet have found someone to support or they haven't found this thing yet. And, and here you are making it available for them if they need it. Is, is that... Is that how you end up in that situation? Yes, yeah. That, that's that's one of the ways I've had, like, because I believe for me, my philosophy is I believe there's no failure and no scenario or circumstance that I've experienced in my life that is not for my good. That's my that's my philosophy. Even let's say when I told you the story about my supervisor when I was starting my career, when he wasn't supporting me, that obstacle became the way. <laughs> As I like to say, the obstacle of him being not able to supply me with the reference I needed to get into a master's degree that I was looking at, it became the way. And it's from that I learned, I'm like, you know what, Faith? No one owes me anything. Like, I'm not just going to, the world doesn't owe me anything. I'm not going to just sit and wait for people to give me whatever I deserve. I have to push for it. And that taught me some resilience. My PhD journey taught me resilience. It helped me discover what I want to do and what I don't want to do, you know. However much it was not the best experience I would have had, but that circumstance allowed me to build the resilience, get a different perspective of where I want to be in my career. So it's all those things that I've come to learn on my journey. And I believe there's no experience I've experienced that has totally been negative. Many of them have either been negative with a learning lesson or some of them have just been positive. So it's from that mindset that I've been able to adopt my philosophies and design how I do my things because I've experienced almost everything that I could say. <laughs> almost everything that if a person comes to me, I'm able to empathize with them, as you said, because I know what they're going through. I've applied for jobs and not gotten them. I've applied for, when I was doing for, looking for masters, I applied to over, I think, 10 universities until I got myself a mentor to help me. But if I didn't gotten that mentor, I wouldn't have gotten a scholarship. And if my media supervisor hadn't failed me, I wouldn't have gotten a mentor, you see. Eh? So everything comes down to a three circle that every uh, every circumstance and obstacle I've faced has led me into using that obstacle as the path to the next thing I'm getting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's from that philosophy that I built how I operate and me, I never take no for an answer. <laughs> like, I believe there's always a way around it. No. So it might not be my turn this time, but I don't give up on it. I will try on it probably next time, but I'm not going to give up because I've received my first no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that, that's really good. You, you reminded mm. me there's a book uh, exactly titled what you just said uh, by Ryan Holiday, that the obstacle is the way. Uh, he's... Uh... <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> it's yeah. It's it's one of the book. I'm reading it now. I'm yeah. late to the party, but I think I like his. I like his. I'm going to read all his books. I think I really like. I like his. Yeah, his writing. Uh, his writing like, is uh, straight on. There is no some some other writers you find that they have a lot of fluff, but for him, it's the real deal. I started reading it last night, but I'm I'll, I'll finish it probably by the end of the weekend. No, it's uh, it's it's his work mm. is good. He's uh, mm. he believes strongly that uh, the the modern world needs uh the ancient wisdom. So he's uh bringing back uh, which is good, which is sto good stoicism. Yeah, so stoicism, which is yeah, yeah, which is good. I think, but he's mostly. I I think it's mostly really just about bringing the a philosophy because. Like you've described this, like when you 
the more you 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 engage with these life scenarios, the more you 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 try to resolve that uh, conundrum of trying to be in the in the in the place where you should be doing exactly what you need to be doing the way you mm -hmm. want to do it. When whenever you try to solve that problem, you're quickly going to end up trying to solve a philosophical problem, and yes. and and so you quickly find that you have to develop, you know, your own philosophy of life, and you 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 find that it's going to actually be unique to you because, uh, unfortunately, and I don't know if many people know this, no one has lived your life. Exactly, I was you, just going right? to say that. Yeah, no one has lived <laughs> yeah. your life, so we all see our lives in diff in our lenses. So if someone does something that I would consider to be, let's say, not good, I won't, I won't say big words here. I won't be, I'm like, why did a person have to do that? But that's how, that's what they saw fitted them at that instance. So, yeah. So I wouldn't so, really, I'm no, I'm no one to give an opinion on what they've done, you know? Yeah. yeah. Because everyone is struggling. Everyone is trying to solve <laughs> the same problem. Yeah. And, yeah, and I think, this is partly why why I'm inspired to do these kinds of conversations because someone may be out there thinking that uh, they are dying alone in the corner or maybe what they're dealing with is so strange, but actually uh, it's not like we're, we're all dealing with it. And I think mm -hmm. the more we can share what we're how we are how we are dealing with these things, uh, I think it's helpful. Like you, not not everyone is going to have the capacity to articulate their method or describe their philosophy or or be able to even understand it or have the mm -hmm. the patience to observe themselves to a point where they they can really understand what's going on. But I think mm -hmm. if 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 you know, that is shared through other people's experiences, mm -hmm. then they may get motivated to try. And, yes. and all it takes is trying. Um, yeah. Yeah. This guy, what uh, Jesus, right? Like the time mm -hmm. when he started his movement, uh, this is exactly what he did. Like he went, he went to the outskirts of the city, he went to the, uh, to the outcasts and, um, the, these people had been kicked out of the city. Like mm. the, the Romans, if if you fail to live to the standards of the city, they'll kick you out. Like go that side, outside. You're not allowed here. Um, so uh -oh. there are a lot of people who are not allowed in the city, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so what does Jesus do when he wants to start his movement? He, he goes like, look, I don't think the outcasts are wrong. So... I will Let me go and yeah, I'll go and live with them and mm. show you that you know they're, they're also just people doing your life. And mm. in the process of doing that, even living with these people who may have been living in less optimal ways, they mm. they go they started to be inspired. They were like, oh wait, so even if I'm in a situation of suffering, actually I don't have to be stuck here. Oh, I mm. I, I could improve myself in all these ways and I don't have to uh, just suffer my circumstances. I can mm. turn them around and thrive and and become a better version of myself. And, and he mm. started to do that. You know, him and his 12 disciples all of a sudden now set the... They built a revolution. <laughs> yeah, right? They, they built the revolution. But it's it's not by making people do it it's more like by participating with them by by showing them what they are doing with them together with them it's like okay look you you do it that way me i do it this way but we we don't have to kill each other and yeah. sort of like being the good example in the situation and i think there's a there's a lot of that needed there's a lot of yes. good examples needed and i think mm whatever whatever little someone can do to share the good example yes uh, is a is an improvement it's not going to make anyone's situation worse 
Yeah. Yes, I'm thinking of it in this aspect, like I'm 30, 30, 36 is young. But when you look at it, you're like, okay, to get to this age, there are so many things I've had to go through. And someone who is in their 20s might be navigating these same issues right now and wondering, what do I do here, you know? And if I don't share my story, probably that person won't be helped, you know? They won't find the, situ they won't find the solution to their problem. Probably if I don't share the knowledge I've accumulated all these years, I'll just cup it. It's like getting this water bottle I have here and I just put a cover on it and just cover it and leave it on the table. It's not going to have any impact. But if I got this water and I used it to water plant out there, the plant can grow into something, you know? So it's it's just sharing what you know and sharing it in your honesty and your own plight. And just putting it out there. You never know who will listen because you never know really. You don't really know. Yeah, well, Faith, it's been lovely talking to you. And yeah. I'm going to stop the recording now. Uh, but this is, this is great. We need to do more of these and unpack some of those topics, the big ones that you brought up that we need to get back to. <laughs> Yes, 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 yes. Whenever you're ready, I'm, I'm already here. I'm already here. Ready. I love to. <laughs> one of my hobbies is talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I it's, love it's, to talk. It, I love I, talking and having meaningful conversations yeah. with people. Yeah. That's exactly. Now, that's exactly the same reason I'm doing this. I was, yeah. I was telling my friend earlier. You know, he was telling me uh, the statistics. You need equipment. Uh, you need all these things, and uh, I was saying, look. It's just those a conversation. Good, those, are, those are all good things to consider. But for me, the reason I'm doing this is like, I just really want to have a nice long chat with someone. That's, yes. that's yeah. it. If I can get that, great. Then all other things will be a bonus. But if I can get a nice long conversation, I'll be happy that's with that. That's good. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's been lovely talking to you. I love, I love talking.